Hello and welcome to tonight's very special event. I'm so excited to be here. Um, I'm your host, Pixie Britton, and I have an amazing guest here with me tonight. Um, I have Darren Kent. He's a renowned film and television actor and best known for his playing his role of the scholar in the US sci-fi series, Blood Drive. Um, some of his other roles include a grieving father from the HBO series, Game of Thrones, um, and Asa Bishop in ITV Encores, The Frankenstein Chronicles. Darren's also a keen writer, producer, and director, and has recently finished directing the Break Series 5 for the BBC. Welcome, Darren. It's so amazing to have you here. Thank you for joining me. And I hope everyone watching this, obviously this is a pre-recorded interview. If you have any questions for either of us as we're going through the interview, get stuck in. Show me those likes, show me those love, all those, all those comments. We would love to hear from you. So over to you, Darren. It's so good to have you. Oh, thank you very much for letting me be here. It's, uh, yeah, it's a pleasure. And hopefully I don't get myself in any trouble tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's often what happens when you're around me, Darren. So um, oh, yeah. I can't guarantee right. that. <laughs> no, it's an absolute pleasure and I'm really excited. Um, obviously, I have no idea what sort of questions are going to be thrown at me. But yeah, I'm uh, it's just nice to obviously talk about some previous memories and yeah, just reminisce a little bit again. Amazing. <laughs> okay, so um, I think to kick things off, um, I just really want to talk about your journey into acting and what inspired you uh, to follow this crazy career? What, at what point in your life were you like, this is what I want to do with my life? To be honest, most of my childhood, I wanted to be a singer. Um, if there was a talent competition or a bit of karaoke in a bar, I'm, I'm, I'm getting on that stage. So that sort of mapped out most of my childhood. Um, and I was on like Pop Idol and X Factors and I tried all that sort of route. Um, and then all my holidays were at Pontins. Um, that was our little £9.50 holidays was a regular little thing in our house. So I wanted to be a blue coat. So once I got obviously through my college, I became a blue coat and got my dream job. Um, and then realised the world's obviously a little bit bigger than becoming a blue coat. So I then got into drama school and then realised that because I'm very different, I'm more expressive. Um, and I'm not really scared of doing anything. I thought acting is probably a better path for me to take. Um, and then very quickly I got casted as buttons um, in pantomime and then that seemed to start the ripple effect, I guess, in my career so far. Yeah, it's amazing. It was actually, the first, the first film that I saw you in was Mirrors. And yeah. we didn't even know, um, because obviously you went to school with my husband, and we didn't, we didn't even know that you were going to be in the film. And we were at the cinema watching it, and he was just like, oh my gosh, that's Darren yeah. on the screen. And it was just so amazing seeing you there. So, um, and obviously we followed your career over the years. So we just, it's just, oh, honestly, yeah. honestly, it's just, it's amazing to see how it's developed and I'm really excited to see uh, to hear more about all of the exciting projects that you've been. Um, oh, yes, you. so, so I mean obviously you know one of the biggest ones that you've been on is um, the Grindhouse, the cult Grindhouse series Blood Drive mm. um, which I'm gonna, I really, I'm so excited about to talk, talk about that. But mm. first before we launch into the whole Blood Drive thing, um, can you talk to me a bit about what a typical day on the set is like for you and how, because obviously you're going from film to film and it must be so different. Um, what, what's, what's a day in the life of Darren? So a typical day on set would be, I get picked up at 5am roughly, there or abouts, um, get driven to set wherever that may be. That could be in Hampshire, I filmed in Marlowe. Uh, in Harringay, North Yorkshire, so that just depends on where they're filming. I'll be on set and in my makeup and costume within the first hour or two of being there, um, and then I'll be waiting in my trailer until I'm needed on set for a blocking. They normally get some seconds to block the scene for the camera's purpose, and then they call us in um, just so they can show us actors what the shot is. Um, and then they'll mess around with the cameras for another hour, and then they'll get us on set where we'll do normally a continuous day, which is 10 hours of filming, um, or if we're lucky, we get a semi-continuous day, which is 11 hours, but we get a break. Um, it's nice to have a break after that long. 
and then obviously drive home. So that's a standard filming day. But as you said, every job is different. So it just depends on budget, um, how high they go, uh, high production value of the shows. That will obviously make a difference as well. If you're working as a lead actor, or whether you come in for just one day, you've got a little scene, um, and they can't wait to sort of say goodbye. Um, it just depends. But obviously, on a, say, for example, a series like Blood Drive, um, I was a series lead in that, so it was the best sort of job I could have ever wished for um, in a country, the stunning Cape Town, South Africa, and six months, obviously, with the best setting around the most positive, uplifting, funny, inspirational people. The African people are just amazing. Um, so you've got everything around you that is just positivity. You're doing a job you love in a country that's stunning, getting paid good money to do what doesn't feel like work. So, but then you could do a job for your mate, 50 quid a day if you're lucky. You're doing 15 hours on set, not even getting fed, there ain't even a toilet in walking distance and it's under golf ball size raindrops and you're freezing thinking, is this where my life's gone? Um, and people only really see the glamorous side um, of your job. They see you as an actor, you're on the telly, you go to premieres, you mix with some important celebrities if you want to call them that. But the actual filming is drooling, it's tedious, it's long, it's torture sometimes. You, your sleeping pattern's all over the place. Um, you're super homesick, you're missing everyone that you love, and it's not until you see it on the big screen that you suddenly think, yeah, I remember how hard them few weeks were, um, but it looks pretty good. So at least it was one that I can sort of stand by proud and say I was in that, rather than a few, which I can no doubt explain later. There's a few that I would absolutely take off my credentials. Um, <laughs> I'm not proud of the movies. It's, it's but, all character developing, isn't it? You know, I think cool. I think even even the ones that you're like, gosh, I really wish I hadn't have done that or whatever. I think it's all, you know, it's a learning curve. And I think I mean, the best thing is it was at the start of my career. So at the beginning, you need credits, you need showreel footage, you need to grab every opportunity, paid or not, just to star in something so that you can nick your little scenes and make it into a little slideshow of your work, which in turn gets you more work. So at the beginning, you, you, you take on everything. Mm -hmm. But obviously, it's not until you've been in the business a while and you think, oh, I remember that one. Oh, I remember that one. And you think, oh, I don't even want to see it again. <laughs> Start and then the family are playing it out of it just because they know it's going to really, really irritate you. <laughs> it sounds like it is it is grueling you know it sounds like i could imagine that it would be really grueling and you know you're away from home for a long time but then you know i guess in the same way with writing you know there's so much that goes into writing and you're working on something for hours and hours and hours like sometimes years you know you're working on a particular project and you go through phases <laughs> of hating it and being like, this is the worst thing that I've ever done in my life. And then when you actually see your finished product, you're like, oh, okay, I've got this immortalized thing that I can get to, you know, say, I did that, I was a part of that. Yeah. So I guess that and must it's, be. Yeah, it's the blood, sweat and tears that goes in, not many get to actually witness and see, but it is the end result that makes us do it over and over again. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes, but then it kills people making movies. I mean, I just, I obviously star in them through work. My agent gets me on myself, but I also write, I don't let up a juice, I've got my own film company. So I put myself through that, even when I'm supposed to be resting, because you're either hungry for it and you're passionate about it, or you're not. You know, some do it just because they like the idea of being on the telly. They want to be famous. You know, I would do it and not get paid. I just want to get good at my craft. I just want to star in everything to show that I am, a strong actor I've just got a lot to prove um to people that ever doubted me um and just in a belief in myself I've got disabilities I've had a lot of obstacles thrown at me um but I'm still charging with full force and I'm still loving it from the day I started to now like I do it because I love it and I'm hungry um and even knowing I'll say it's grueling I make it see I mean it is it's torture and for an average person to come on set they would struggle they would but it's the ones that you can see that get the excitement, the buzz that's wrapped around it. I mean, yeah, we get treated sometimes like mine. We get people running around like little lunatics after us. But then other times we don't. We, I mean, we offer to carry equipment. We're not just sort of 
going to sit or I'm not going to just sit there and get pampered. I'm a working class lad that's had to work hard. So I'll actually so, grab so a Essex, an Essex boy, born and bred. Uh, so. exactly. <laughs> exactly. We, work, we have to work hard for everything <laughs> we're going to achieve. So I'll happily grab a tripod and be like, all right, let's go. Yeah. I, love it. I love it. That's amazing. Um, and obviously, you know, as we kind of touched on it a little bit um, just then, but, you know, and I, I guess especially during COVID and things must have, you're having like all of these different challenges around uh, the film industry and, you know, travel and things. Um, you know, you're spending a lot of time away from home and you're, you know, away on set, you know, you've got a partner, you've got kids. Um, how do you guys cope with the long distance? Uh, it's probably me doing my job being away for so long while we're probably still together. <laughs> um, to be fair, um, obviously at the beginning is great, I get a job. Um, she's already planning in her head the next handbags that she's going to spend the money on. Um, but we just know then, okay, Christmas is going to be nice or whatever. You know when you just get that little bit of luck. And uh, we look at acting as luck. Um, I'm up against hundreds with every audition. Um, and there's so many amazing talented people in this country. Um, so when I don't get it, I don't be disheartened because of the talent, you know. But obviously, we embrace it as a family, I think, when I do get the jobs. So, yes, yeah, sometimes I'm away for a few days and it's not too bad. Other days, it's a few weeks. And then, obviously, worst scenario or best scenario, depends how you look at it, I could be in Cape Town for six months doing the next big sci fi series. So, you sort of have to just Except that this is the train I'm in. This is the job and the dreams that I've had. Um, and I want to be a household name. I want to be in everything. I want to be hot property. Um, I've had a taste and I'm hungry for more. So I am going to be charging with all guns blazing for the next good 20 to 30 years I see in my head. I don't see so a retirement. That's a lot of handbags then, isn't it? Um. <laughs> in the house just for the handbags it's getting ridiculous now <laughs> honestly but i mean in terms of the distance obviously it's it's hard work you know it's not being nice being away for so long it's only relying on skype um but we know at the end of it we get to have a nice little premiere we get to meet some guys go and watch it on the big screen get excited again which then gets us more work so she's the most supportive um absolutely follows my career she's always the one who does auditions with me today we had an audition today. so she's the other side with the camera she's reading the other characters for me so she throws herself very much involved just like i do as well as my best mate who's obviously equally as outstanding they always come around and hold a light or do what i need him to do in my hours of need um but we just make do the best we can sometimes it's nice to have a break from the kids i love them I love them. You can choose your friends. <laughs> um, it's nice to have a little break, but yeah, sometimes it's a bit too long. But you have to just remember why you're doing it. Mm, That's all. The bigger yeah. picture is worth it. In everyone, everyone gains if I go and work. So, <laughs> so they can't moan at me. Yeah. So, so there's one question that I'm dying to ask you. Um, but I'm going to kind of refrain from asking you because what I really want to know is who are the biggest jerks you've ever worked with? Who are the biggest deceivers? You know, like the word, I can imagine there's so many of them. However, I'm not going to ask you that question because obviously we want to make sure that you get future work and that you're not blacklisted in Hollywood. So um, I've had enough of my career anyway. Let's shame them. <laughs> Let's get the shameless going. Yeah, 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 let's get an audience. So um, maybe we'll save that one for the pub. But um, so yeah. I'm going to flip it and I'm going to talk about okay. the legends. Uh, you know, the okay. absolute diamonds, the people that you've worked with that have been down to earth, just amazing um, okay. in every sense of the word. Okay, well, number one, there's definitely a handful of ones I would love to show, but I won't, and it's the right thing to do, I agree with that. Um, but yeah, we'll see, we'll see how the evening goes, I might pop a bit later. Um, as for legends, there's, I mean, I've, I can't not start by mentioning Andrew Hall. Um, he played the gentleman in Blood Drive, um, and we obviously we passed away two years ago, um, and that was just devastating. Um, and it came out of nowhere as well. So obviously working very closely with the gentleman with Andrew in Blood Drive. 
Um, we were like a family on that show, you know. So he was a legend. I learned so much from him um, and we had such a laugh. So he's right up there on the list. I would say the one person that I am in awe of watching, um, this is someone obviously I've actually experienced first day I'm working with, not just people that I idolise like David Jason. Um, but Colin who plays Slink, and I saw Blood Drive at the moment. Um, but he's probably one of the most creative, most talented actors I think I've ever worked with. Um, he's right up there for me. Um, he's just a genius, I could watch him all day. Um, so he's awesome. Um, and it's difficult because Bob Hoskins is just one of the nicest gentlemen, um, fatherhood sort of um, chap. And I was in Snow White and the Huntsman with him. That was his last movie, basically, before he passed. So I, I felt very lucky to work with Bob. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's so many. Because Sean Bean was lovely. Keeper Sutherland is a diamond. Dominia Clark's just a little sweetheart. So there's so many. It's, I'd rather name and show. <laughs> to, that's such an easy question. Um, but, yeah, I mean, all, all of the A-listers, that you have in your readers, oh, I wish that they're nice people. They are. All of the eight, I mean, I've worked with Ray Winston, there's so many that are big names and they are so lovely. They're so supportive. They don't look down their nose at anyone, however big your character. You could be in one scene or you could be the opposite him in as a supporting lead and he will treat you the same. And I love people like that. It's the ones that are nearly there, just popping up in a few more bits that uh, create the most trouble in my experience. Um, but yeah, shout out to Andrew Hall, Bob Hoskins, and obviously Colin Cunningham, because they're legends. Yeah, well, 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 you'll have to give me your dirty laundry list down at the pub and then... Yeah. <laughs> Bring it back Ireland. <laughs> I love that. So obviously we've kind of touched on Blood Drive uh, a little bit, so I'm going to launch into that. Um, I mean, I've Brilliant. only watched the first few episodes. Um, I wish I had time to watch all of it. Um, but I mean, I'm a huge fan of Grindhouse. I love, you know, gore, horror, all of that kind of stuff. So when I um, heard, when I first heard about Blood Drive um, and then started watching it, it before this interview, I was just like, this series is just absolutely insane. Okay. I love it. Hey. <laughs> It's got this cult following as well, you know, and the, it's, I guess, a, a lot like, you know, that kind of planet terror and, the, you know, um, all of those kinds of things, that kind of um, just, yeah. yeah post-apocalyptic universe. Post-apocalyptic, that's all, that's all my yeah. bag, you know, as a post-apocalyptic mm. zombie author, this is totally my bag. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk a bit about um, the kind of the geek in me loves to learn mm. about things like, um, the prosthetics and like the actual the cars that you guys were like using because you you essentially someone had to make those cars right that are like literally grinding up bodies <laughs> and, like, you must have had barrels of blood you know it's just there's so much gore and and all of that yeah. that went into it i mean can you just talk a little bit about that and about what they had to do in order to, to build the world of blood drive Seems I don't think any of us really knew exactly what we were walking into. Even from the script stages when we got it sent for the audition, and I really thought, this is nuts. And they weren't your standard series. They don't just say, do a scene and give us an audition. They wanted like 10 scenes, and everything had to be done to a certain level of organising. So from the off, they set the tone for anyone that was in it. But when you get there, you see the crazy costumes, the crazy characters, Everything's bright like a circus because it is a crazy blood fest, just born of colour of all these nut jobs. Um, but everything from the most panicky detail, from the cars being very American, very big, but very stylish, the engines were taken out, but they were all very functional cars. And they just added all these special effects. And you almost in some cases had animatronics that they would just use as the blades that are spinning, just going really, really quick, that just churn up. And they were really working sharp bones that were brushing really quickly. I mean, you wouldn't want to get your hand in there. They had to look like they were working and they were. 
I know in some of the engines they added a bit of CGI just for just extra speed in which they were moving, I guess. But everything was fully worked. Um, but they are crazy with the with the effects, even with the live casts that we had to have. So obviously, you know, well, you would know if you'd seen more than just two episodes. So I don't want to say too much now. Yeah, no spoilers. <laughs> because it only gets crazier um but obviously you know that all the races have bombs in the back of their heads so at any point their heads can explode so it wouldn't be much of a spoiler to say that life casts of some heads had to be made um but then it was crazy coming in on i don't know we've been probably in cape town for six weeks we've been on set quite a lot it's quite strenuous at this point we're starting to feel it and I remember just one morning, really tired, all of us were. There was me, Aki, um, Marimo, who plays Aki, the robot, and Slink, Colin. Um, and we'd just arrived, got into Colin's sort of area, if you like, his Slink area. And there was just about 10 Slink heads, all just staring at us. And they were all slightly different expressions. And it was just, we were so tired. It was about five in the morning. We didn't get into ridiculous hours the night before from a night shoot. And then just suddenly walking in, I thought I was going mad. Seeing all these Colin Cunningham heads just staring at me with different expressions. Because obviously with a big smile, it was just so surreal. It was a mad moment. But yeah. so sorry. Yeah, the answer to your question is the effects were the best, highest standard I think I've had the pleasure of working with. Um, I mean, recently I've worked with Legacy that did Predator, Alien and E.T. and Jurassic Park. They've done all the animatronics and anything that really moves, any designs that they, they created, the legacy team, they're incredible. Um, so they're obviously probably the best in the world, but take nothing away from the Blood Drive team, because they were they were sick. That was a hundred of The effects were great, the stunt team were off the scale, the special effects makeups, they don't miss about and they had their work cut out, as you know, the amount of blood, if you're only on episode two, there is swimming pool lines. I blood. know. I mean, honestly, there's so much gore. I was just like, it's Thank gore you. overload. It's not. It's not for the faint-hearted, is it? Like you've got, the, you've got to have a strong but, stomach. <laughs> you have, but the difference is with this grinder split is the fact that it's not your standard. So they take the mick very much out of the genre. They don't care if they offend you. They are out there to have a laugh, to celebrate grinders, and. That there's a lot of comedy and comedic moments thrown in that absolutely highlight that. So it is a bit of fun, but it's fun at its highest production value. Like they had something like five million per episode. So they really spent the money well. The set is on the art department, the costumes, the effects, the stunting, the cars, like they had money to be panicky and they absolutely executed it perfectly in my opinion. I love being in Blood Drive. I felt so lucky to get that at the point in my career. And that was the biggest series for me. I was only supposed to be in two episodes, but luckily I made an impact and then they wrote me in another five or whatever it was. So I was just, luckily my character was liked and I became the sweetheart of the series, which I'm not, I can't even, there's certain things I can't say because you ain't seen it. There's so annoying. I nearly gave away something then, but if you haven't seen it, it'll be too much no, of a It was on my list to watch, you know. I mean, I don't have, a, a bit like you, I don't have a huge amount of time to watch telly these days. So um, it's just, you know, and I think, because I don't have, I don't have, I don't think I have sci-fi. So it was like, I, I, I missed it. I think I, when it originally came out. And then I was, um, I was kind of hoping that it would come to Netflix and stuff. And then the end, I just ended up buying it on Amazon because I was just like, I'm just going to watch it. It's actually quite expensive, though, isn't it? Yeah. That's yeah, actually it, really expensive to buy. But, yeah, but I mean, I've been loving it so far. So I was kind of hoping, I was like, oh, I really want to watch all of it. But, you know, um, so I haven't had the chance. But I'm, yeah, so obviously once I'm I... I'm angry, I'll be disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> I'll forgive you. <laughs> Um, so obviously the other uh, big show that you had an appearance on was Game of Thrones. I mean, I was a huge, huge Game of Thrones fan. Um, and again, it was one of those things where I was watching it and then saw you uh, on on the, that scene with Amelia mm -hmm. Park, and I was just like, oh my gosh, she's in this scene. That's so cool. Um, so you know, what was it? What was it like being on the set of Game of Thrones? See, that was if it's in the earlier start of your career. 
everything seems a lot more heightened than what it maybe really is because everything's like a wow factor, everything you're learning. I did blood drive quite later on in my career, so I was blown away by the scale of things, but not because it was new. With Game of Thrones, it came at me when I'd already been in Mirrors, which was a, one of the biggest sets I've ever been on. And then obviously, there was other little elements of shows that nothing on the scale of Game of Thrones. Like, you normally see three sides of the room that are set. The other side is where all the cables are, where all the crew are hiding normally. But Game of Thrones, everything's like 4D. You don't know where the cables are. You're constantly going, like you're walking around a real palace. Like, they really are kingdoms. Like, the big stair banisters, there's no crew hiding. If they are, they're not in the same room. Everything's done on a much more advanced scale, I think is the way it's all explained Game of Thrones. Um, everything's done in a much bigger scale. They've got so much more money. Um, and they, there's thousands on set. Half of them, I've got no idea what they're doing. And I'm quite clued up with crew roles um, and what most people are doing. But there was thousands on set, all doing something, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, that was, it blew me away um, being on that. I didn't watch it, I wasn't a fan, I'm not going to lie. Oh, but really? my, brother, my brother was so excited. Going on my car during Game of Thrones, and, uh, and I was like, well, it's great. I was just chuffed to be in another series. But you know, if it was Prison Break, I would have been jumping up and down. Well, you know, if it was Unforced and Horses, then you know, I'm, I can equally share that excitement. But Game of Thrones just wasn't something I watched. Even with dragons and mystical and, you know, magicians, didn't really appeal to me. Like, see, Harry Potter's is not something I would watch. So I thought, right, I'll watch a few episodes, just get me head around it. So I watched, I think, the first season, and half of them got killed. I'm like, so who am I actually working with? Because <laughs> I was in for it, and they just chopped his head off. So I was well confused. Um, but I did like it. It was a good series, and now I'm like you. I'm a massive fan. Um, but it's just a nightmare, because obviously I know some of the cast, and I'm always getting them. We chat a lot, obviously, about the future seasons and what was coming. And I don't want to get told anything that's going to happen before everyone else gets to see it. I'm one of them fans that likes to watch it and get excited weekly rather than have to just, yeah, be people telling me stuff. So I knew the Hound weren't dead. I knew Jon Snow was coming back. And it done me head in because um, it made it less enjoyable watching it. But Game of Thrones was wicked. Um, I've got no bad stories or bad experiences being involved in that. Um, yeah, I feel very lucky, to be fair. Um, they made me feel so welcome. Um, and I made some really good friends. I'm still really good friends, um, yeah, with the girls. So it's just, yeah, it's, it obviously helped my career. I would say that's probably the reason why I got blood drive. Um, getting given all the opportunities in characters where you get to be emotional and show off. Again, they're the most interesting roles, sometimes the most memorable. And luckily for me, I was in obviously the scenes where it's quite iconic in the books, mm -hmm. which obviously was just again an element of luck. All I did was got given the audition sheet. I just had to deliver it the best I could, and someone believed in me. Thank God. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Well, was it but, was an amazing scene, very emotive. I'll, I'll never forget it. It was really good. You. you know, watching it, um, I was just absolutely blown away. So um, yeah, I'm not surprised you got um, the the blood drive gig off the back of that. Yeah. Um, it's so different as well. It's so crazy. Yeah. So I mean, uh, I guess my next question would be. Um, Obviously, with Blood Drive, you were away for a long time, uh, and mm. like you said, you know, you guys kind of all became family. Do you have yeah. any like amusing stories to to tell, like any kind of like yeah, behind the scenes amusing stories? Okay, I mean, yeah, we were there obviously a long time. All going out together, drinking together. Well, we didn't drink loads, but we would go out and more wine and dine together after a long day. Um, I'm very close um, with Colin, who plays Slink. He is in the writer's circle, or not writer's, the magician's circle. I don't know what they call it. It's just to do with magic. Um, but he's in this really important circle in America, and he's outstanding at magic. So every event, if we're there uh, having a barbecue or whatever it was, he would pull out a few of these little dynamo moments. 
And I'm fascinated with magic. I'm just, because I've got a lot of I know I'm rubbish at it. So, but I love watching it. So Colin would always pull out a trick where he's bending something or making something move without him going near it. And it was just, yeah. And he ended up teaching me a lot of magic. So now I've become Colin in my own household. If the family around, I'm like, sit down, check this one out. And I'm always trying to do something now. So Colin Free's Magic um, was just, yeah, that sort of took over. He's always a showman, he loves it. Andrew Hall, the gentleman, um, he was a wine connoisseur. So he, he was the don when it comes to wines. So we all went out on a vineyard. Um, well, I say a vineyard, there was four vineyards that we visited in one day. Um, I'd never been to a vineyard. <clears throat> so I didn't really know, I just knew it was wine testing. So I thought I'd have some of that. Being an Essex boy, I like a little tipple. So we went um, to four vineyards. Um, I think we got louder and louder as we were going from one to the other. Um, I don't believe in spitting in front of women. Um, I was brought up better than that. So when someone tells me to spit alcohol into a bucket, it ain't happening. Um, so I say it's because I'm a gentleman. It's also because I'm a raging alcoholic. But I won't spit in that alcohol. <laughs> so, no, I'm not an alcoholic. I mean. So I ended up very, very drunk. Um, but I learned so much about wine. Um, and that's because of Angel Hall. Um, so I can't really tell you much what went on after that because I don't remember it myself. I don't know how I got home, who undressed me and put me to bed. Um, but I just I remember it being a great night. Um, yeah, it's hard because the stories are all just relating to almost being feeling like a tourist. Um, like when we were there, we were as normal as possible. We'd go to work, we'd come home at the end of the day. It never stopped there. You had to learn the next things for the next day. So you've been on set 14, 15 hours, but then you're going home and learning a script for a few hours, then trying to go to bed with the script constantly repeating itself in your head, and then you're up again at five to do it all again. And you do two weeks on and you get a few days off. So it's, yeah, it's, but in our off days, we would go to places like Robin Island, go and see where Nelson Mandela obviously was incarcerated, um, go and see some dolphins or penguins on the beach and appreciate the culture and obviously what Africa has to offer, um, which is obviously amazing. Um, but yeah, we just got really close as a company, as, as colleagues, and just enjoyed each other's company because that's all, you've, that's all that was around us, you know? So luckily we all got along. Nothing worse if you have a bit of a tip with someone. But we, they were a bunch of amazing people. Um, and all very different, different pieces of life. But we had such a laugh. I want to talk about, obviously, as a fellow writer, I want to talk about, um, you know, obviously you, you started writing, branching out into writing and directing, which is amazing. Do you have any uh, personal projects that you're working on right now in between your filming? Yeah, I'm, I've just directed two short films. Um, one of them is a horror film. I don't normally choose horror. It's not a genre I would normally um, direct, but I just saw this little script and I thought there was an actress I wanted to work with, Samantha Anderson, um, and I knew she would be great in the role. So we've took on this horror film. So we're in the edit and edit uh, now with the editor, um, doing our best to make it even scarier, which is an experience for me as a different genre. Um, and the other film I'm directed is a film called You Know Me, and it's about how the family is suffering with a member of their family with dementia um, during lockdown. Um, so that's more emotionally driven. Um, it's going to pull on a lot of heartstrings. They're the sort of, that's my comfort zone, I would say, as a director. Um, normally when I'm involved in a project or if I'm producing or putting money into a project, it's normally one that's got huge social realism sort of attached. So if it's relatable um, or it's to do with mental health or something that you know, we can all sort of associate with, then they're the sort of scripts I tend to head towards. Um, but yeah, two very different films, both with two different editors. So at the moment I'm upsetting and annoying two editors um, for the price of one, <laughs> which is always amazing. So I'm constantly, yeah, throwing notes at them, but it's molding, both of them are molding up to look really lovely. Um, so we're at the final stages of that, um, nearly picture locked on both. Um, what else am I doing? I've just finished an American series, 
Um, but again, that's acting related, not directing. Um, but I did direct a series for the BBC um, called The Break, um, which was wicked. The theme for that season was disability. So we got to work with some amazing people. Um, and yeah, again, it was just nice to show a bit of diversity and just show that uh, even with your disability, it won't stop you getting work. You can, there's no every there's availabilities and stuff available for everyone. And it's just nice to be able to do something close to my body, obviously with disabilities myself. Um, I want people to feel there are opportunities for everyone. Um, but yeah, I'm directing um, in a couple of months. I'm starting a new feature, um, which is about dogs that get kidnapped and used for, for dog fighting. So we're now sort of finalising the script with that, myself and Jane Gold. Um, but yeah, things are happening. As long as the dogs don't get harmed in the making of the film, then I'm, I, I'm okay with it. <laughs> Never would that happen. Never would that happen. It's funny because I've got, um, as I've said to you before, I've got dogs. I used to have four. I've only got two now, unfortunately. But all of my animals have starred in some of my movies. Um, and it's funny, the dog snatching one that we're doing, it's called Lost Christmas, and it's my little scrappy, my little white Jack Russell. It will be his debut. So he's, he gets kidnapped, which is really sad. Um, but yeah, all my dogs have starred in something of mine. And it's, it makes me so proud. Or a bad influence, one of the two. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <clears throat> Amazing. Um, so just to finish things off, really, um, I just want to talk about what's next for you and what films you're currently working on. So I get to be a monster in an attic in the next few weeks where I get to kill a couple of kids and a mother. So yes. not a rom-com. Yeah, but I'm not gonna lie, I can't wait to kill them little sprogs. No, <laughs> um, that's gonna be an interesting one. Um, they've got a nice little budget, they've got a good team around them, um, and the guy is a special effects king, so um, no doubt the effects are gonna be really, really good. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, that's something different. Uh, what else am I up to at the moment? I've just wrote a, a pilot for a series based on Victorian London, the slums of Victorian London um, is set on real people in 1892 around a real sort of street um, of Venice, mainly prostitution, pickpockets and poverty. Um, so yeah, it's like a dark Oliver twist. So I've just finished writing the pilot of that with a co-writer um, and I will be hopefully getting that ready and prepared and hopefully investors and everything else I'm on board so that we can begin the preparation for making that early next year. So that will take up a lot of my time, but obviously in between. If an, an audition comes out and I go through and get it, that will delay everything that I do with my own film company. And I focus purely on that, because that pays the bills. Um, and then, yeah, in between, I've got my fingers in a few pies, so I'll be uh, keeping as proactive as possible. That's sort of my next sort of few months, I would imagine. Love it. That sounds amazing. Sounds like you've got some really yeah. exciting projects in the works there. And uh, honestly, I can't wait to, to continue following your career and seeing where you're going to go and finishing Blood Drive. And I'll be texting you when I finish that. Um, so, okay. yeah. <laughs> you've got to watch it. You've got to watch it. Yeah, amazing. Well, anyway. Um, Thank you so much for um, joining welcome. me tonight. I've had such a blast chatting to you. I hope you've enjoyed it too. I hope everyone watching this has enjoyed it. Um, you know, as I said before, if you've got any questions or comments, please hit them in the comments section now and we'll do our best to answer them. Um, oh, yeah, and amazing. Thanks so much. And you never know, hopefully we'll get you back here again and we can do a follow-up yeah, in six months time or something to see uh, where you're at. I would absolutely love to catch I'll be you. in prison. <laughs> Going like they got done for fraud. <laughs> all, all those celebrities you've been bad mouthing to me that I just <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. tired me up and tortured me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it'll be a pleasure and thanks for having me and yeah, I, I welcome any questions. I will do my best to answer every single one if I see any. Um yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure, Prixie. So thank you so much. Well, and I look forward to the to interview number two. Yeah, lovely. All right, take care and I'll speak to you soon.
Take care. All the best. Thanks, See bye you bye. soon.